the from it was called like an angry makara vehicle of the sea god varuna part elephant part crocodile the strange beast rose from the belly of the sea bearing death the east india company's ingenious deception lacked the cunning of the trojan horse but made up for it with lethality 48 pound guns mounted on a floating platform let loose at the maratha fortress of ghedia as it drifted close to the walls european soldiers african mercenaries bombay sepoys pathans the infantry massed for the kill like so many brilliant ideas though this one ended in disaster the from you see sank before it did any damage to the maratha fort to make things worse historian anirudh deshpande has recorded and i quote widespread drunkenness prevailed in the ranks due to the supply of free rum to boost morale 3 centuries ago this year kanhoji angre victorious at ghedia and the architect of maratha triumph over the combined navies of two great imperial powers england and portugal could finally bask in the sunshine of being the unrivaled king of the konkan coast later this week as prime minister narendra modi meets with the leaders of the four nation indo pacific quadrilateral alliance the quad the question of indian naval power will lie at the core of their discussions faced with the rise of china india is making significant investments new delhi knows the united states won't alone carry the burden of securing the indian ocean so new aircraft are being tested for the indian carrier fleet and new submarines are being inducted kanhoji's success and eventual strategic failure hold out important lessons for the future of indian maritime power little is known of kanhoji's origins he is reputed to have been born on the island of varsova yeah the one in bombay today to a father who served under the king shivaji bhosle early in his career he seized the island of khanderi from the marathas rivals the siddhis then historian patricia rizo writes he used this base to capture a few small armed vessels kanhoji's early fleet included at least one ship captured from the portuguese as well as a large bengali owned ship that was taken when it was carrying freight to mumbai today some people might call this piracy and even back then his enemies did that late in 1698 an irate east india company agent in surat wrote maratha forces had seized upon two salt vessels belonging to this island took the banyas and others that were on board imprisoned and most miserably beat them saying that they cared not for the english the emissaries sent from padmadurg to collect the ransom were arrested by the british and their own salt ship was seized this display of firmness seemed to pay off i'll quote from that same letter the subedar of konaji angra having wrote to the deputy governor it reads promising that he would get the two men that were imprisoned by padam druk released and for the future none of our inhabitants should be abused we permitted the salt vessel to go leave aside the spelling and the mistakes of fact the name kanhoji would soon become familiar to the british he picked up where he'd left off among other things his crew seized a ship carrying an east india company official to its trade outpost at surat the officer was killed kanhoji kept the ship and raised a ransom of 30000 rupees for the officer's wife as a commander of shivaji's crown he was entitled to a customary chauth or one fourth of the proceeds these actions though were absolutely no different from those of the great maritime powers who also engaged in piracy the portuguese had long preyed on merchant traffic in the red sea bearing treasures from mogul era notables for the custodians of mecca the east india company founded historian gv scamel reminds us by men experienced and enriched by atlantic privateering in turn profited from the capture of portuguese traffic and assets from east africa to south china like the modern indian ocean the world kanhoji inhabited was also a competitive one lesson number 1 is those who aspired to rule the seas needed treasure however they got it the indian navy this year received a significantly enhanced budget 
but it's still well short of what it believes it needs. Through the last decade, expert Samir Patil has noted, the defense budget has barely kept up with inflation. From early in the 18th century, contestation between Kanhoji's forces and the East India Company escalated. Appointed deputy chief of the Maratha Navy in 1690, Kanhoji rose to its leadership in the course of the next decade. Vessels of all nations were attacked, Grant Duff wrote in a 19th century memoir, and repeated descents were made along the coast. Few of the defenseless mercantile towns from Travancore to Bombay, he lamented, escaped a visit from these depredators. Even though Kanhoji's ships lacked the firepower of the English fleet, historian Deshpande records, he proved an adroit tactician. He avoided direct line-to-line confrontations with English ships, slipping into shallow waters under the protection of shore-based artillery whenever confronted. In 1718, the East India Company attacked Kanhoji's fort at Kandheri with apparently overwhelming forces, as well as intelligence provided by a defecting Portuguese mercenary. The walls, though, proved impervious to English naval artillery. The use of the from, of course, did not alter their fortunes in 1720. Faced with Kanhoji's growing power, Portugal and England allied in August 1721, committing themselves to a joint attack. This time, they picked the fortress of Colaba, which, according to a contemporary account, was enclosed by a wall 20 to 25 feet high and about 700 paces in circuit with two main gates. The key to taking this dangerous objective, historian Edward Tegin tells us, rested on finding an open gate. Instead, the only means of access was a narrow flight of steps which was heavily guarded. Fifty attackers were killed just in the initial assault. The naval bombardment too yet again proved ineffective. The third day of the battles saw Generals Pilaji Jadhav and Peshwa Baji Rao himself appear in support of the fort leading the panicked Europeans to withdraw. For modern Indian strategists, this ought to be a second lesson. A determined and well-led force can face those far superior to them. European technological superiority did not automatically translate into victory. Leaving aside some occasional raiding, Kanhoji's remaining rule was unchallenged after 1722. One poke in the side from the Savant of Kudal ended with the upstart king's villages being burnt to ashes. Leaders like the Siddhi of Janjira cast an occasional covetous eye on Kolaba, but they were pretty easily bought off. Kanhoji actually tried to make peace with Portugal and even reached out to England in 1724. Five years later though, he died, leaving behind six known sons and his wives and many concubines. Even though Kanhoji's navy held its own against two great imperial powers though, its fleet never truly modernized. Transitions from reliance on oars to an oceanic fleet driven by sail never took place. His navy relied moreover on foreign gunners, often mercenaries, and fell behind on technological developments in artillery and musketry. Perhaps most importantly, the Angria forts themselves were vulnerable to being choked since they depended on the hinterland for supplies. The Maratha Navy scholar Surindranath Sen noted in a book written way back in 1941 was, I quote, like a child of arrested growth. It progressed satisfactorily up to a point and then stopped. Like so many medieval stories, this one did not have a happy ending. Kanhuji's sons fought amongst each other. The English backed their rivals and the Portuguese and Dutch allied with the English in open hostility. Peshwa Baji Rao himself eventually turned against Kanhoji's successor, Tulaji, believing the Angre navy to be a bigger threat to him than the East India Company. Following Kanhoji's death, the growth of European economic power inexorably told. Even though Tulaji could terrorize merchant shipping, he could never pose a genuine threat to the great powers of the time. The most important lesson then is this. India's naval power and influence can't be independent of its overall economic situation. 
former Navy Chief Admiral Arun Prakash has long argued for India to show greater vision and determination in its pursuit of maritime capacities and work in a focused way to become a genuine shipbuilding power. China today doesn't just have the world's largest navy, but it's also the world's biggest shipbuilder measured by volume. The steel of swords can win great victories, but the foundation of strategic triumph, Kanhoji's story teaches us, is silver. I'm Praveen Swami and I'm National Security Editor of The Print.